welcome to Geek Freaks. I am Frank, and I'm joined by Jonathan. Well, hello. All right, John, what have you been playing? What have you been watching, man? So, I've been playing Assassin's Creed Origins, still trying to get that finished. Also, a little bit of Minecraft, um, but I'm oh, yeah. most looking <laughs> looking forward to the uh, the update four for Satisfactory. I'm, I can't wait for that to come. It should be, they said the 9th of the 16th of next month. So, oh, man, that's going to stop everything I'm doing to play that. I've been, yeah. I've been getting an itch for something like that. And, rant, you know, we, we both kind of got back into Minecraft, and it was so out of nowhere, too. Like, we plan on doing our D&D session. Our DM couldn't show up. And so Kevin, of all people, who's new to Minecraft, he's like, I really want to play Minecraft. And then somebody brought up, like, let's do it role-playing style, because, you know, we were going to do D&D. And so then everybody was, like, on fire about that idea. So, <laughs> yeah, now it's Minecraft RP style. And we've already mm -hmm. had, we had, like, the nicest guy in the world is Kyle. and right away he broke the rules and like slaughtered some guy and all his animals and, and burnt his house down. And I was like, um, so we have server rules and you just broke all of them. So can we go over these real quick? Right. But yeah. <laughs> we have a lot of characters in our Discord, so they, it makes good RP. Yeah. Um, yeah. What else what what, have you been playing? Well, I, yeah, so I've been playing Shadow of Mordor been, or Shadow of War, been doing that on the stream and just free falling in love with that game. It's such a perfect game. I can't wait for you to play it. Eventually, I don't think you should play it right after Assassin's Creed, but you definitely need to play it. Um, it just it gets me hyped for Lord of the Rings and the new Lord of the Rings series. It just I, I almost want to read the books again if I had like time. Um, mm. It's so good. But speaking of reading the books, you're currently listening to Ready Player Two, which is our next next audiobook. By the way, at the end of this episode, guys, we're going to be doing the audiobook for X Men: Days of Future Past. The, then two audiobooks from here on, it will be um, Ready Player Two. How is that going so far? Good, good. So I'm I'm glad I'm getting a leap start ahead of all you guys because yeah, you know I want <laughs> to take my time and pace myself. Uh, but I can tell just right away by listening to it the uh, the way it's written, the way the narrator and the story is being told, and everything is is right up my alley. Uh, the first maybe ten minutes got me totally hooked. I mean, they lay out the setting. It takes place right after Ready Player One, uh, but then the story starts to advance pretty rapidly. So uh, yeah, I'm I'm already hooked on it I, it's it's like a tw uh, 13 i think 13 hour 13 and a half hour Ooh. audiobook so it's gonna take a time some time to get through it so i recommend you guys all start you know at some point soon but uh yeah I'm, I'm excited for it i like it so far for newcomers like myself i i started reading the first book i just couldn't get into it um but i did of course watch the movie and loved it so how so far have you found any problems not reading the first book and just seeing the movie no, I mean everything that they explain uh, so far with the setting and all the stuff correlates directly with the movie. Okay. So I haven't I haven't noticed anything yet that I like don't understand. There, I'm sure there's more um, depth in the characters and stuff like that from reading the book. Uh, you understand the relationships better or something, but yeah, so right. far it it's it makes perfect sense for me having just watched the movie. I think have you watched the movie recently? Because it's been a bit for me. I might have to rewatch uh, it right away yeah, before I, think I start playing. I think it was like two years ago or something like that, but a year and a half maybe. But yeah, I, I really liked it. So I remember most of it, but yeah, it probably would be good to rewatch it before you start listening. I did that with X-Men, which I think was a really good call on my part. Uh, watching Days of Future Past and then constantly comparing the comic ver book version, audio slash audiobook version, uh, to the movie was really fun. Kind of like seeing the different takes and how like, oh yeah, you could have done that in the movie. Like nobody cares about Kitty Pride this much. In the movies, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> and it makes more sense in the, in the books and stuff like that. Um, but that was really fun. I, you know, we pre-recorded it, so that's why we're talking about it in this way. But I, I, that was the first comic book audio book that I was like, yes, this could be a genre. So um, I'm excited. Audio books, I'm getting into them a lot right now. So it's pretty cool. <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah. Let's go ahead and get into the news. Uh, we have Jared Leto's new, Leto, whatever, a uh, new Joker out. This is the one that's going to be in the Snyder Cut. It'll probably just be a cameo, but it's a dramatic change for Jared Leto's Joker. What did you think of Can you first describe what they kind of look like and then what you thought of them? So you're just talking about the two pictures on our website, right? That's it. Yeah, we put them on our website, guys. But those, but those came out and the internet just like blew up. They're like, oh my God, is this the future? Stuff like that. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. So it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't show a lot, but it does. I think the pictures do say a lot. Um, it's him. You see a close up of his face with the white makeup. Mm -hmm. Um, no, you don't see the comical grill and the, the super vibrant colors, the green hair and stuff. 
the old Jared Leto feels like he fits in the the um, what's it? Batman Begins. The, the Suicide Mr. Freeze. Squad. Oh, I no, oh, yes, you're seeing, yeah, like forever. Yeah, like, Batman forever. That's it. Yeah, yeah. So he looks like he he fits that better. That kind of yeah. extreme, cartoony, kid friendly version. Um, this one, and the, sorry, the other image is him sitting, I think, on like a a prison bench or something like that, and he just looks real somber, but it's very neutral tones and. Uh, it's not, it's not vibrant, and it ha- I think conveys more emotion than his crazy, colorful, uh, tattooed grill self that yeah. we've seen before. And so, what I'm hoping is that this version of him is uh, him being conditioned after prison, after being in, in a prison uh, in uh, Arkham Asylum. Right. Uh, that he was already kind of zany and wild and kind of weird and crazy and wanted to be a thug and. Being in a mental institution like this broke him, made him crazy, and exposed to him the, uh, I had a good word for it, but the, I guess, broken nature of humanity that yeah. he dwells on as a character that's kind of a, a staple, at least since Heath Ledger. Um, and I love that that aspect of it, so I'm hoping he was already kind of weird and eccentric and, and stuff, but this is a turn in his character that humbles him, makes him you know not such a, a thug, but more of a criminal mastermind, and and focusing on the fact that this whole world is broken and it's just it's it's yeah. the last joke kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, like life's a joke or this society's a joke. Um exactly. so I notice that we don't see any of his tattoos. And there are a lot mm-hmm. of theories going around by that. First off, I think it's just because they're like we can't have his face the way it was before. So there's that. Um I think he has more makeup over the tattoos is what it is. So he has the tattoos that are just under makeup. But a lot of people are saying because he was in the acid bath, that maybe tattoos don't stick around on him for some reason. Like maybe they can't stay in his skin. Um, I, I I just like this toned down version of him. We haven't gotten much images, mm-hmm. just a couple of them, but it's very to me it, it it instills some hope in the character because I had washed Jared Leto out. Like I don't care anymore, right? Um, yeah. Do you, but based off these two images, which is not a much, not much, would you want to see him in more movies? It, it. I want to see this movie. I want to see. I mean, it was, this is just a cameo, isn't it? Yeah, it's just a cameo. Yeah, it's just a little bit. Yeah. So, I, so I was reading online. I was, I was trying to look up some of the other stuff he was in, and it looks like, at least from IMDb, they're predicting there it or they're uh, rumoring, I guess, that there is another Joker movie in the works with him in it. That is oh, with being, him in it. Wow. Yeah, that's being just being you know negotiated or whatever right now. Um. So yeah, I guess this this cameo is kind of the deciding factor, probably if it's yeah. if it sells well or not. But I'm hoping that this version of him also, uh, that Jared Leto himself and the producers and directors uh, are taking a little influence from Joaquin Phoenix uh, in the Joker movie. Yeah. Just a little, like, mix those two together and kind of wash out some of the BS that people don't love and make something new, but still stay, stay on the tracks, you know? That, that uh, Joaquin Phoenix Joker movie, like, there's some people who just do not like it, but I, I yeah. really love that movie. Mm-hmm. so well and it just it shows such a good range of acting skills that's what i love is yes you could see you can see jim carrey play jim carrey in every movie he plays that's fine adam sandler plays adam sandler but to see joaquin phoenix become this guy it's just like wow that is that is some good acting and a very well written character and, and yeah. story so i love it that final scene the uh i mean we're going off on a tangent a little bit here but that <laughs> that late show that talk show scene Mm-hmm. that's a master class i mean that's just yeah. so well done watching yeah. knowing knowing oh fuck <laughs> knowing that character and what he's been through and then you're watching him because you know how dangerous the beast is you know that there's no cage around him and nobody mm-hmm. else around him understands him at all like that it, it's just so cool it's just so well done and, and even the shots done like the-, the shots from like the talk show host point of view where he's like looking mm-hmm. over his shoulder like you know it is just like, man, that is such a good shot. That's so well done. Yeah. Have have we done a deep dive on that movie? We have, I don't remember. Dude, <laughs> listeners <laughs> are tired of us talking about that movie. We oh, did a two-hour review on just that movie, which is uh. the length of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and uh. then it was funny because not only that, like the next episode, we ended up adding like 20 more minutes talking about that movie. So, mm, And then another 10 minutes on this one. <laughs> yeah, we might it might show up. <laughs> And uh, we have another spinoff that's going to be Patreon only. That's a major spoiler right there. But um, that might show up in that list. <laughs> it's going to yeah. be in there. Nice. Okay. So uh, next up. Oh, by the way, are you excited for Snyder Cut? 
Because I, I, oh, yeah. I'm not, I myself am not, because I'm not necessarily a, a big Zack Snyder fan, but they are building a lot of hype around this. Do you think that's something that we needed? Do we think we needed the Snyder Cut? So, so I, I, I don't know if I remember how this works, but he was going to re-edit uh, the footage from... from Justice uh, League. Yeah. So, I'm excited, but I haven't seen Justice League. So. Oh, oh, oh my God, <laughs> Javid. Okay, don't watch it. Let's try this out. Let me hear me out on this. Okay, okay. You yeah. watch this version first, and then the uh, re-edited that's a, version afterwards, okay. and we get your reaction. Since I've watched it the other way, and I know uh, Jonathan or Squeaks, you know all the people. Squeaks and Daniel both watched <laughs> it the right way. That would be interesting okay. to see what you think, because then that'd be yeah. a different take for you. Because it's, I love the they old changed 90s. directors and everything. Yeah. I love the old 90s animated uh, Justice League and some of the Justice League comics, but yeah. I just didn't, this, the movies leading up to this and then this movie coming out, they just didn't look good. They don't, nope. they're not keeping up with Marvel from what I could see. So I was just no. like, yeah, I'll hold off, never got around to it, but no, I think it's a good idea. up with Marvel. <laughs> yeah, I know. That they need to just go ahead and buy DC. That so hard, man. That's my Friday morning <laughs> yep. is cup of coffee. WandaVision, Twitter. <laughs> <And> I'm, <laughs> I'm tweeting out about like just the coolest things, and it's a lot. Not a lot of shows are just. I'm mean, like Game of Thrones was the last show I think they did this to me where like I watch and just like okay replay. <laughs> like I, I could just watch it again. So, <laughs> Start it over here, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> next up, uh, Disney is shutting down Blue Sky Studios. So Blue Sky is known for like Ice Age, robots. We were just talking about robots last week. Um, Rio. Mm. I really like the Rio movies. There's a couple of them. Um, and a few more there. So they're shutting this down because they don't really need another animation studio. They already have Pixar. They already have Disney Animation. Pixar makes their Toy Stories and whatnot. And Disney Animation, like, Tangled and Frozen, they're covered. They didn't need this additional one. Some of the employees will move on to those other uh, animation houses, but most will not. Uh, and we also know that the IPs from Blue Sky are not necessarily going anywhere. They are making an Ice Age series for Disney Plus right now. Disney Animation is going to be doing that. So my question for you, Jonathan, uh, do you think they should continue any of the Blue Sky franchises, make another Ice Age movie, Rio movie, or anything like that? Uh, I think if they were off-brand enough from the traditional Disney you know, series and, and such, if they were different enough, then I would keep it like, you know, this can be the house for whatever, all of the certain category of movies. But because it's so similar to everything else they do, and it's not to the same par, same standard, it doesn't have as, you know, yeah, it doesn't have the same recogni recognizable name. Um, that's, I think this is the only way to go, is just kind of cut it out, let it go. It's unfortunate so many people are losing their jobs, but that's what happens with an acquisition if one company buys another. I mean, some is retained and some is liquidated. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think that's probably just the best move for them, for Disney. A lot of fans are wanting Disney to sell Blue Sky instead, instead of just dissolving it. Um, they want them to sell them over to Paramount. Do you think they should consider this, or would this just be bad business practice? Yeah, I mean, well, they'd be creating their own challenge. Like they would be, yeah. they'd be giving somebody else the tools to create great content against them in their same field. So it's good to have uh, adversaries or whatever. Good to have competition in in your field. Um, some competition but you don't want to you know if they arm paramount with something no doubt paramount's not going to take out disney anytime soon right. um but a few jabs at them might be more than they want to see so um yeah I don't, I don't think that would really be in disney's best interest maybe in the consumer's best interest sure i could see that paramount might make some more of these movies but i don't see paramount taking like rio i think is the best one out of that list i don't see them taking it and making it any better or making more of them I right. could see Disney making more and maybe even better the series or movies from Rio. Um, so I don't think Paramount is is equipped to to do much more with it than than Disney liquidating it and reabsorbing it. And looking at Paramount's IPs, the best one they have is Star Trek. So yeah. if they were to use that animation house to make a new Star Trek movie, like make an animated Star Trek movie, okay, but that's such a long shot. And yeah. really it's expensive to animate the way they do. I mean, they have a lot of assets they bring over to with them uh, because of the movies they've already made, but it's expensive to do that. And yeah, it's funny that you, they, it would be competition, but when a Disney movie comes out, I almost don't compare it to anything else. And that might just yeah. be biased and it, it probably is, but like 
the great example is Trolls. The Trolls movies come out, and I'm like, okay, there's a new animated Trolls movie. Whatever. People will watch it. <laughs> Those movies are specifically for people who have kids, in my opinion. But mm -hmm. when Disney comes out with an animated movie, I'm like, oh, that's the new Disney movie. I'm going to watch Soul right away. Or Coco. And there's a feel to that. Like, Coco is a masterpiece. It's mm -hmm. wonderful music. I listen to Remember Me often. I love that song. <laughs> But when like, like the new, me. Yeah, when a new Trolls movie comes, I'm like, okay, yeah, if I had kids, I'd probably go watch that. But otherwise, why would I? Hotel Transylvania, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, and yeah. I think that's just the the difference in Disney's ability and skill is they can market a kids movie to adults. They can write a kids movie yeah. that appeals to adults that has a di diverse, you know, uh, appeal to their audience. So I just think that yeah, you know, Blue Skies doesn't can't keep up with that. Yeah, it, it, Paramount. in a way, it would be kind of nice to have a version of Blue Sky at Disney that's just kind of like, yeah, you know what they used to do? This reminds me. Remember when like Lion King came out? Amazing. Mm -hmm. takes the But then Lion King 2 and 1 and a half come out. And it's like, okay, that's a different studio. Expect those up at Blockbuster more than at the theater. That kind of yeah. thing. Maybe Blue Sky could be kind of like just their filler content, but maybe they don't want to hurt the name or anything. Yeah, well, they already, I mean, they put a lot of stuff straight to Disney Plus, too. I mean, they make, yeah. you know, small, easy movies. Uh, I'm thinking, like, what was it? Like, the Disney Channel back in the day would have those those made-for-TV movies. Um, God, I can't think of any of them right now, but... Yeah, like, uh, Johnny Tsunami and... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Was it Under Lucky Raps. the Irish? Was that one of them? Lucky yeah. the Irish is one of the very good ones where the kid finds out he's <laughs> a leprechaun. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, so, it would be kind of cool if Disney had a separate little channel a category that had all those kind of movies and they kept turning those out because those are great those are hilarious and i don't think they <laughs> yes, do they that are. very much anymore i wonder if those but... are disney plus i need to check <laughs> yeah we got we Probably. got we got st patrick's day coming up i might be watching some mm -hmm. luck of the irish and just laughing at how we bad could, that is we could do a Man. special geek freaks event everybody watch luck of the oh, irish with us god could you imagine oh, that'd be great <laughs> i know yep. you all have it because we're in between we got wandavision and we got uh winter soldier coming up so We've got content after content on Disney Plus. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so, yeah. Um, okay, let's move on to our next thing here. Netflix is adapting the Red Wall children's series into a movie, a movie and then a, a full-on series after that. So Red Wall is a book series. I think it's like 21 books. And we were, I was like, oh, I've never seen this before, but the art's really cool. And it's like medieval stories, you know, classic fantasy stories, but with like mice and rabbits and stuff like that, and badgers as the characters, as the humans. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know about it, but I had mentioned it on Twitter. We have the geek feed on our, I'm not Twitter, um, Discord. We have the geek feed on our Discord, which shares basically all our Instagram posts and articles that we write into the geek feed so people can discuss them. And people were like, oh yeah, I love Redwall. Redwall was really good. Redwall was a big part of my childhood. I never heard about it before. But it looks really cool. Do you, okay, is there anything from your child, any books, I have one in particular, from your childhood that you'd want to see adapted into something from Netflix? So I wouldn't say specifically books, but I'd love to see um, Saga. I know we've both read, well, at least course, I, yeah. I don't think I've, no, really, actually, I just finished uh, reading all the so Saga comics. And uh, yeah, by the way, know, real quick, mm -hmm. you weren't on the episode, but we discovered there is more Saga coming. Good, good. I, I'd seen that too on there. Uh, I mean, the way they, they ended it, it's like, you can't just leave it. There's got to be more. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it, it could could have been a final ending, but it would have been very disappointing. Um, but it's a really good story. It's it's a really good story, but there is a lot of adult content peppered into it to, I don't know, pique people's interest and all that good stuff. But uh, I would love to be able to, like, when my son's born, you know, when he's a little older, be able to read that to him or him read those stories, uh, these adventures of this family that's trying to seek refuge, pretty much. Um, but it is just too adult for him. So if they made a series based on that, they can go in depth too of the small missions they go on and stuff would be kind of cool and explore this whole, um, humanity kind of learning, uh, morality and stuff like that in the process of trying to stay alive. So I think that'd be really cool. That, that, that's a really good series to adapt into a children's series. Um, because two of the big things two of the big underlining stories is uh parenting for mm -hmm. for new parents you know because that's such a big part of the story and then um like acceptance because yeah. they represent two different factions that don't like each other and stuff like that and it's like mm -hmm. those are really good lessons to teach your kids um and the parenting one especially like for new parents it's got really good stories in there about that um but <laughs> yeah visually <laughs> you can't be showing that to your kid it's it looks crazy. oh yeah this 
that was way too. Much. I was thinking like maybe I can like get a, a, a second book because I'm not going to ruin my first book. Right. And then I'll just like like put post it notes over certain pages <laughs> or yeah. edit some of it a little bit so I could like show him the pictures but not all the pictures. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but so if, if, I'm sure nobody else knows yet, but uh, Marco is one of the main characters in the book. I'm naming my son Marco, uh, pretty much based on that character. So I'd especially like to be able to you know show him that because of that too. And at some point but, you will. I remember I read my first adult comic book like in the fourth grade and so <laughs> i mean i i knew that i was like oh i shouldn't be reading this but it was a really good story about elves and stuff like that so um mm-hmm. eventually he'll be able to grasp the themes and be able to go from there but just not yeah. right away it won't be <laughs> bedtime stories <laughs> right i know but that'd be cool that's what i'm saying is if they adapted this into like yeah. children's children's stories that'd be perfect for me i'd like to get dinotopia which is a, a series of books that were mostly just gorgeous images like you guys could see these really great paintings um, it's about a kind of an ancient society. And there are later ones that are like steampunky where they live side by side with dinosaurs. So the dinosaurs are their mounts and their pets. And mm. it's just these really great images. Um, I used to be able to just sit there with those books and just dive into them. And, and like, it was almost like where's Waldo where you'd find like, Oh, these little kids in the background playing with a little dino. And, and Oh, this one is, um, I don't know, whatever, all kinds of little activities throughout the day. And it'd just be like a marketplace with, humans and dinos living next to each other but it was such a beautiful world and to see that on screen it had a lot of it like one of my favorite ones was all kind of middle eastern um tunisia i think is the, is kind of the, the location i'm thinking of those kind of buildings like the the, the um what is that called it's not adobe but kind of like that um, yeah tattooing. beautiful yeah it was all this like red <laughs> rock too so it was really cool looking uh it, if they could ever adapt that i just think it's a slam dunk and I know yeah. there's been like attempts to kind of like use the name and stuff, but the books were think, fantastic back in the day. I think they made something similar a long time ago, not uh, as good, very cartoony. A Flintstones was, you know. Oh, uh, you know pe- what? People and dinosaurs. Yeah, I, yeah. I they, forgot they nailed it already. That's right. They nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, that sounds cool. I mean, that's I love that like imagery too to be able to see like Jurassic World, but you know, people living peacefully with the dinosaurs. That'd be tight. I need to buy those books because when Marco's coming over, I got to be able to read books to him, and these would be really cool books to read to him. So there you go. <laughs> and I, I know, I'll be like, oh yeah, I got these because Marco's coming over, and I'm over there like, oh yeah, I remember these. <laughs> <laughs> I could see Speaking that. Speaking of Netflix, <laughs> yeah. Speaking of Netflix, Chappelle shows returning to Netflix. So this is kind of a cool story. Um, mm-hmm. I think it was HBO as well, but Netflix and, and probably HBO had bought the rights to Chappelle's show from, I want to say Viacom, whoever owns Comedy Central. And so they had the rights to stream it just like they would for anything else, any other show. The trick is, because the show was made so long ago and Chappelle didn't really do a very good contract when he was younger, he explained when we first talked about this, that he was young when they offered him the contract. And, you know, when you're struggling, you're young, and somebody's somebody's like, here's a few million dollars to make a TV show. Uh, Yeah, here's my name. Like, who cares, right? Mm -hmm. Well, now that he's older and wiser and, and has plenty of money on his own, um, this deal went down and he's like, you guys are, you know, people are going to sub to Netflix and HBO Max to watch The Chappelle Show, a classic. And I'm not getting a red 10 out of this. Uh, HBO, I don't know, again, I'm just throwing out HBO, but I don't know for sure if it's them. They continue to do it. But Netflix was like, you know what? That's fair. Let's take the show off of our streaming service. They already bought the license for it, so they didn't need to do that. Now, that was last year. Few months have passed by, and what was revealed uh, this week is the Chappelle show was returning to Netflix, and they made a deal with him. So he says they called me up. This is a Chappelle quote. Uh, they called me up, and I got my name back. I got my license back. I got my show back, and they paid me millions of dollars. Thank you very much. Netflix did not need to do this. They already had a license for it. They made an additional, almost honorary contract with with Chappelle, giving him their version of a license. And some additional money that they did not need to shell out. I want to keep saying that because it's just so freaking cool. Why did Netflix do this, Jalen? Yeah, so that's <laughs> that's comp that, that's um, confusing or or complicated. That doesn't happen. I mean, it, this is a business out to do business to make money, and they had the money in hand. They had you know the rights to the product, and they were ready to give it to the people and make money with it. And here they decide, you know what, the artist isn't getting paid enough. Let us pull him back in and renegotiate terms that we don't need to negotiate to help him out and show good faith. So I think 
for one, it's it's good PR. For, yeah, it's good PR for for Netflix to to the public to see that they work well with their uh, their artists and their you know actors and stuff. Uh, but also, it's good PR to the actors and say, hey, you know, if if I have some content I want to put on Netflix, or if Netflix wants me to do a documentary or do a new series or something like that, you know, they take care of their people. So that's you know, it's building up their image. Uh, on the backside, though, they might have bigger plans. If they take Chappelle's, you know, show and put it out there and just start, you know, releasing it, yeah, people will watch it. They might sub just to watch it, but that'll fizzle out and die. Maybe they have plans for a new Chappelle show, and they're like, you know what? If we bring him in, he's on the interfold, and we got a good deal, and he trusts us and likes us and stuff. He is totally going to be on board to make a totally new series, or you know, maybe oh, it's great timing uh, for it too. Chappelle show would do so good right now in this climate. Oh man. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, they have a lot of very diverse, uh, different shows on Netflix right now. So maybe they're going to have something else where he's just walking around talking to comedians or whatever, you know, like comedians yeah. in the car, kind of whatever, uh, something different. But I think that's the main reason why is PR. Yeah, it looks great. And to, to get him in their inner fold to hopefully make something new and really good with that, it. That makes sense because he, he's got a couple stand up specials on Netflix already. So it's probably also just kind of like, Look, we keep Chappelle around, and he's a very big draw. I mean, his SNLs are some fantastic SNLs whenever he does that show. Um, so, yeah, it, something like that for sure. That's a good call. Yeah. All right, next thing, let's kind of, we're going to rapid fire these, and you're going to tell me what you're most excited for. All so right. we have a lot of casting news that happened this week. A lot of casting news, actually. So for the Borderlands movie, we had mm-hmm. Jamie Lee Curtis joining as Dr. Patricia Tannis. And Jack Black joining his Claptrap, which he's the funny robot, so that's fantastic. Yeah. For The Last of Us, we added the two main characters. Joel is going to mm-hmm. be played by Pedro Pascal and Ellie Dope. by Bella Ramsey. Now, you might not remember that name, Bella Ramsey, but you do remember the little bear from Game of Thrones. A little Mormont, the one that's like a badass oh, yeah. little girl. That's her. Yeah, She'll yeah. be playing Ellie. Oh, so that's, that's cool. dope. Yeah. For the Twisted Metal series, this is a TV series based off of Twisted Metal, the old PlayStation game where you drive around and kill people. Uh, mm-hmm. the clown, the main character, Sweet Tooth, is going to be played by the one and only Will Arnett. So that's going to be really good. And then lastly, yeah. uh, Mr. and Mrs. Smith series, based off of the old movie with, uh, was it Brad Pitt and Jan- uh, Angelina Jolie? Mm-hmm. We have Donald Glover from Atlanta, and he's, he's basically our new Lando Calrissian. And we have Phoebe Waller-Bridge, who is from Fleabag, a series that is just so phenomenal. I can't suggest it enough to people. Very well written. Of all this cool casting news that we got this week, Jonathan, what are you most excited for? Dude, I, those all sound great. So I've, yeah. I haven't played Borderlands, but I love Jack Black. That can't go bad. Jamie Lee Curtis, you know, she's cool. But I mean, Jack Black is great. Especially uh, with Claptrap. Claptrap is a character that like is unintentionally, because he's a robot, he's like unintentionally hilarious in a way yeah. that's like, it's hard to explain. But if you can imagine a robot that's like, oh, let's go, let's go kill this guy right now because we could use his parts. <laughs> like that kind of like yeah. funny thing. What was that? There was a. Uh, I'm trying to think. There was another character, a robot like that, that was in a, a movie, but it was like a low budget movie. Anyways, yeah, yeah. I totally know what you mean. Um, the Last of Us, Pedro Pascal, like that. That'll be great. Uh, and and uh, forever, man. He's so good. Bella Ramsey. I'm I'm interested to see Bella Ramsey being what like four or five years older now. Yeah. Um, uh, that's got to be that's got to be different. But she, I mean, she commanded the screen as a little girl. Like she, she will. Totally grabbed it by the balls, I imagine. You could tell that they did um, not plan on her being such a big role, but as soon as she was on screen, it was like Baby Yoda, where it was just like, we need more. Oh, and so they had to have written her in for more <laughs> badass scenes where she's... Yeah. Which, didn't she die to, like, a, one of the giants, I think, had a killer or something like that? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. They grabbed her. I that yeah. series. So good. But yeah. Yeah. Um, and Will Arnett's hilarious. I love yeah. Will Arnett. So, I mean, I don't know how good this series will be based on Twisted Metal. That's going to be mm-hmm. kind of interesting, but... I'm hoping, you know, he plays like uh, Dr. Roxo for Metalocalypse is what I'm oh, imagining yes. him doing. It would be fantastic. Oh, my um, God. That, I definitely want to see Will Arnett <laughs> play as Dr. Roxo. <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I mean, and Donald Glover uh, is freaking amazing. I don't, I, I didn't hear anything about this Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Smith uh, series before. Very early development. Uh, that, so. that came out like, that got on the notes at the last second. That just is being announced. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but I love anything he's in. So, of all those, I think Last of Us is what I'm most yep. looking forward to. But those all sound pretty dope. So we got some 
good stuff being worked on right now. I- I'm really excited for The Last of Us. I'm going to actually stream both games uh, in the lead up to that series being released. So I do need to, like, I've played it maybe a little bit a long time ago. I'm going to play both of them on our, lo- on our stream, but it'll be a lead up to it. So we got we got a while, a while before that's a thing. Um, the Mr. and Mrs. Smith series, that I'm really interested in because if you think about it, that's going to be two spies constantly mm-hmm. like working around each other trying because the first half of that movie was like them not knowing that each other are spies well like the first act yeah. is them not knowing each other are spies second act fighting each other third act teaming up to fight the world that mm-hmm. makes such a good series if you could extend that out more like that is actually really good for a series donald glover is funny in everything he does plus he's a really great improv actor mm-hmm. phoebe waller bridge is one of my new favorite actresses in the world after uh how good fleabag is which is one of the best shows on television right now so, I think that you know has who's making crazy... the series. I don't know who's. Ma- I know it's for Amazon, um, uh, okay. but I don't know who's. Ma- which is no surprise because Phoebe works for Amazon, basically. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know, but man, I, when I saw that, I was like, it took me a second, but I'm like, yeah, that is a really good show idea. Why didn't let somebody come yeah. up with that earlier? You know, yeah, sometimes that a could, reboot's that could... really a good idea. <laughs> and I feel like our writing these days, like back when that movie came out, it was you know late '90s, early 2000s, mm-hmm. or something like that. You know, our writing was different, but now there, there's, I think, a lot more attention into, like, depth of the story, and you can make a, uh, an amazing series just with that kind of concept. So, I'm, yeah. I mean, you can make a dud, too. <laughs> you, can, you can bake a cake with the wrong ingredients kind of thing. Totally, so, hopefully totally. they, with such great actors and a good storyline, and, you know, people liked the movie when it came out back then, so uh, I think it'll get some attention as long as they do it right. I really enjoyed that movie. That was... To me, it was a classic when it, right when it came out. It was really good. Um, okay, let's go into our next thing here. We have the CW orders a live-action version of the Powerpuff Girls. Uh, this is going to take place while the girls are in their 20s. They will be mm-hmm. disillusioned with their crime-fighting past, so like trying to... They're not, they're not real supportive of the crime-fighting lifestyle. I'm a little bit worried by this, Jonathan. To me, when they said they're in their 20s, I'm like, oh boy, do we have another teen drama from CW? Um, yeah all the worst parts of arrowverse <laughs> right what do you think so about this that that's the problem for me is the cw if it was on almost any other network i would totally be behind it because i honestly it seems uh, not normal or something like that uh i liked powerpuff girls when i was in like high school and stuff i thought yeah, it was a lot a of us did, yeah. good show i mean yeah it's little little girls that fight crime and stuff like that but this is just well written and kind of funny and mm-hmm. good to watch uh, but yeah, a new version of it where they're, you know, it's live action, they're teenagers or they're in their, sorry, in their twenties. Um, it's just, if it wasn't CW, I would, I would have faith in it, but I just can't see that being done right. I mean, if, it, if it was on HBO, I would totally watch it. I would be stoked about it, but yeah, I, I'm just worried. I mean, CW has a few good shows. Don't get me wrong. I'm watching black lightning right now and I'm really liking it. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to hold my breath. I just say that. Yeah. There. Yeah. I would say for like every 10 CW shows, there are three that are really good. And so mm-hmm. we'll have to see. Black Lightning is a good example of one of the good ones, but man, mm-hmm. I don't, I have no interest. I know there's a lot of fans of it. I have no interest in Riverdale and that's like <laughs> so big for them right now that I know that they're trying to make more Riverdales. And I'm just like, nah, I'm okay. I actually like Archie comics too. I just don't care to watch Riverdale at all. So we'll see how it is. I'm a little worried about it, but we have another adaptation coming up. A Wizard of Oz reboot is coming uh, from the director of the Watchmen series. John, did you watch the Watchmen series? Uh, I did. I watched, let me get this right. I watched like the first seven episodes, I think. Oh, wow. So almost and, all of it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, is there only one season? Yeah, there's only one season. Yeah. Oh, okay. Then yeah. So I watched, I watched most of it. Okay. Um. Yeah, so it was it was pretty good though. It was, I think it was uh well written. It was done well. Um, yeah. I just don't I don't think I finished it for some reason. Yeah, I I, I really liked it myself. Uh, it was actually followed up after we reviewed the first Watchmen comic book, like the main comic book. Um, mm-hmm. so I was kind of you know high on that at the time. Uh, this is gonna be based off the original Wizard of Oz novels from back in the day. Uh, the director Nicole Castle will direct the first three out of nine episodes. Uh, my question here is. Do we really need a Wizard of Oz reboot? Is this one of those franchises that is best left behind? Like, for example, I'm going to give you an example of why one of them I don't think ever needs to be rebooted or remade is Hook. Mm -hmm. Hook is perfect. Why would you want to... Any kind Mm -hmm. of remake of Hook would be bad, but you can remake Peter Pan all you want. That's fine. Just don't remake Hook. You can't replace Robin Williams. 
You can't do that. Yeah. So I kind of feel like this is the same thing. What are, what are your thoughts? So on that, I disagree. So really? we saw, we've we seen, you know, great Batman movies back in the day with uh, uh, Val Kilmer and, <clears throat> you know, good, good actors back, I don't know, good <laughs> actors back <laughs> in the day and stuff. I'm, now I'm questioning everything I say. Um, but then, you know, all of a sudden we got that uh, Heath Ledger's Joker and we're like, oh crap, that's amazing. Now we've, we've been going downhill, but there was good Batmans before that, good Jokers before that, uh, Jack, uh, Jack Nicholson. Jack Nicholson, yeah. Yeah, and then so it didn't need to get messed with, but it got messed with, and something amazing happened. Uh, we've seen many varieties of um, uh, Sherlock Holmes, and you know some some great, some okay, some kind of uh, probably shouldn't have been done. And now Enola Holmes kind of sprang out of that. So I that think was, it's great. Yeah. yeah, I think it's great to toy with it and, and try it over and over again. I think the last Wizard of Oz movie I didn't care for very much, but. I think it it would definitely be it's a good story it's a good foundation a lot of people know it so I think it's totally worth trying to to remake and do something new mm-hmm. and if they stay with the kind of style that they did with Watchmen I think would be great you know make that's, it kind of a yeah that's a the saving grace to me is Watchmen's style was so well done um some of the characters you know oh god some of the characters that they they kind of created or were like mm-hmm. almost nothings in the comic books that they made into new characters that are now some some characters I was heavily invested in makes you wonder like okay were there characters in the background of the Wizard of Oz that that need their moment to shine and there might be like the cowardly lion why is he cowardly did something happen like you could really dive into their backgrounds we've yeah. had a lot of Wizard of Oz additions and remakes and stuff like that in the past um God do you remember like it was in our childhood Wizard of Oz two it was just straight up a sequel. No. <laughs> she okay so she that. i'll kind of i'm gonna uh, this is so the reason i remember this movie so well is i thought this was the original because mom like would rent this and mm-hmm. rented it a few times because i wanted it a few times and it was the only version of wizard of oz i've seen so i thought it was a real movie and it's so scary but this is gonna i'm gonna do real uh, the roller skates the roller skating guys that have okay. roller skates in their hands <laughs> the robot that she has to wind up the big like fat robot she has to wind up yeah. At the end, she's in a room where she has to go into another room and find the green thing to say the scarecrow. And they end up flying. And remember, a chicken egg goes into like the big bad guy that's going to kill them. And they end up yeah. flying off on a couch that they've kind of like tied together with the moose as the head of the couch. And they end up flying off. So freaking nuts. And really dark, actually. There's like this lady that has like interchangeable heads. It's a whole thing. Very dark movie. Yeah. Um, was. So there's that movie. There's also like they had Zoe Deschanel did a Tin Man series off for TNT that was Wizard of Oz. Um, was there anything in the remake or anything like that in the past that you think was better than the original uh, Wizard of Oz? Um, no, not that I can, honestly, no. I think that they, they've all been kind of a swing and a miss. I agree. Um, that's why, I mean, I, the funniest stuff is like other shows' versions of it. Like I love um, uh, Futurama's Wizard of Oz episodes and stuff like that. Yeah. But. Uh, but to I, I think it could use a good good remake. I don't think this is one of those things where we we left on a high note. Let's seal it up and not touch it. So I think it'd be be worth a shot. I yeah uh, I think the the Watchmen aspect of this whole thing really gives mm-hmm. me high hopes. I I wish that she was in charge of the entire series, but she's only doing the first three. But those first three are often the most important. We found that out with like Game of Thrones. Um, we'll have to see. They really got to nail this because there's mm-hmm. there's a lot to explore in that world. And again, with the, yeah. them going off the books, there might be something that I don't even know. Because I just seen the movies, so. yeah. And I like how you're talking about you know elaborate on why the cowardly lion is a coward. It'd be cool to have a series that starts far before Dorothy ever comes into the picture. Yeah, just just build the world and you know do a lot of you could follow the different characters in their different walks of life mm-hmm. and build a lot of depth into them. And then finally, eventually, you know, season two or season three or something like that, or the very end of season one, you know, Dorothy come uh, arrives and then they all kind of converge and then start the mission wow. together kind of thing. What an interesting idea wait. that like you wouldn't have Dorothy show up until the last episode. That that that's a that's chancy, but I like it. That's a really good way to finish that season. Yeah. Huh. And and not be from her perspective, be from the you know the rest of the people. Yeah. That'd be interesting. That'd be cool. Let's see. Uh okay. Uh we have theaters in South Korea that are being really awesome right now. They're because they're closed right because of COVID, of course, that's how life is. Um they're actually renting out their screens. So you could have up to four people rent a screen for two hours for $90 or $135 for the entire night. You bring in your video game system and you can play video games on a theater screen. 
I, I, I mean, I was already thinking like, okay, what game would I play? So what game would be improved by the theater experience? Now, remember, the, the key to this too, and the, that's why my game that I'm picking is on there, is not only is it like a really huge screen, but you have that awesome sound system that they have in the theater system too. Do you have any games at the top of your head? So for the most part, I wouldn't want, I don't think I'd prefer to play a game on a, such a big screen. I think that'd be harder. Like I'd rather play, you know, just with the monitor. But with the ambiance and everything, I think uh, I have, you know, of course I haven't played a million different games. Uh, but one of them that I would appreciate in a theater is uh, Bioshock. And that sound effects of how the the um, suspense you get when you yeah. are near a big daddy and you don't you don't have enough health or ammo or something like that and you hear stomping and sound effects I think I think that'd be pretty cool. You have like that random like trickling water somewhere and you mm-hmm. can hear it in the theater like off in the corner. Yeah, Little that's a really good choice. Sparks of electricity from Destroyed. Yeah. For me, I chose Halo, um, and oh, yeah. specifically like the last level of of most Halos. Um, you're in a warthog. Like I think it's Halo Two. We're in the last level of Halo. You're in a Warthog and you're driving and just everything is exploding around you. And then on mm-hmm. that sound system, you have that guitar ripping like, bah! you know, it would just be <laughs> like, I can imagine just like sitting in the back of your seat like, oh, it's too much. It's just so great. Right. Um, Need motion seats for that one. Oh, you, oh that's a good idea. Because that, yeah, that final level, I, I want to say it's Halo 2, where you're just kind of like the Warthog, you're just suggesting that the Warthog stays on because you're like <laughs> narrowly landing on things and it's just so freaking epic and the world is just blowing up around you and it's so yeah. cool. Um, and Isn't when that, you're on one of the halo rings, it's being destroyed. And that's what it is. Yeah. I think you're on a halo yeah. ring while it's being destroyed and, and you're on a warthog and of course you're just master chief and you're just like, let me just drive this warthog to safety. <laughs> and uh, it's just so crazy badass. And I remember very well, like the warthog barely lands on things and like you're, yeah, it's just tumbling. And it's already like, shit controls on a warthog so here <laughs> oh man but it was just like such an adrenaline high after that fa- final level that i was like that on a big screen with that cool sound effects and that mm. th- some of the best music in gaming oh that would be so that would be more powerful than like an avengers movie that would be so <laughs> adrenaline rush that yeah. would be really good but i would probably if i had this opportunity to rent it for the whole night instead of playing any specific game i would do movie series like I would get all my friends together, or whatever, and do we're gonna watch all the Matrix movies or all the Lord oh, of the yeah. Rings movies, oh, or yeah. watch watch Game of Thrones from beginning to end or something like that. You know, we just need a case of Red Bull and some junk food. Yeah, Game of Thrones would be really interesting on a on a big screen like that because like so much of Game of Thrones is the scenes between characters, but mm-hmm. you know that would still be good. But man, like the scenes where like you have you know Draco. With a dragon, you know, like flying through, burning people, like, oh man, that's cinema attack. That's that's meant to be on the big screen, you yeah, know, something like that. Uh, okay, we have Microsoft is creating a brand new company. Uh, this is part of their purchase, basically, of Xenomax and, and Bethesda, and that whole Xenomax's properties. Uh, this new company will become, from what we see so far, there's no like firm things. This is all done through uh, European Union uh, filing papers, but it looks like Xenomax will actually become vault the new company vault it's assume we assume it's getting the name from fallout which is bethesda's game because you emerge from the vault every time you start a new game of fallout uh this is they're they're still waiting for the approval over at the european union for the 7.5 billion dollar acquisition heavy price tag but you know mm-hmm. that's what you're gonna do um why do you think they decided to make its own company instead of just becoming, hey, you're now part of Xbox or just stay Xenomax. Why do you think they decided to make an entirely new company? So I think this is, I think it's, if it is what it looks like, it's a good uh, step, a smart step for Xbox, for Microsoft uh, to be creating a, a separate company to do a little bit of a pivot because like we've talked about for a while, consoles are on their way out and yeah. the devices these guys are making are gaming computers that sit on someone's mantle instead of next to your desk so they're kind of working closer and closer as as uh you know uh xbox and playstations evolve they're getting closer and closer to just being pc game uh uh, gaming pcs anyways so i think this is their pivot to now you know xbox makes halo and all these other you know known for console games and vault is going to be all their new pc games and some of their games are cross-platform. Some of them are, are great on the PC, like we play Sea of Thieves, mm-hmm. but it's also played on the Xbox. So I think they'll pick some of those apart and kind of put them with Vault. Put, you know, Sea of Thieves will be a Vault game, 
and ones that are known for being played more so on the PC. Uh, but that way they could, you know, differentiate themselves and start to develop that that uh, online gaming, you know, PC gaming presence and, you know, force their way, push their way into that market as as the console gaming kind of diminishes is what I think. I know. Yeah. Sorry, I know that was a lot. <laughs> no, no, that that is an interesting idea. So making vaults kind of like their PC gaming wing, basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, my thought is maybe this is because they don't want to make Bethesda games to... They, they mentioned this in the past. They don't want them to be exclusive to Xbox. And the other titles, mm-hmm. maybe they're like, look, those are exclusive Xbox titles. But everything from vaults is for everybody. And that would go kind of what you're saying, too, where they're more about a brand they're more about a company that's making games less about like the xbox is just an xbox Mm -hmm. um so so yeah so because the idea is like elder scrolls it's so crazy to think that that would be an xbox exclusive it's such a big game and the new one coming out Mm -hmm. will take over the world that year comes out you can already tell you i can already tell you it's gonna be game of the year it's just that big of a game um and so do i they already said that they're not gonna make that exclusive to xbox and i think vault might be their way out of it like oh hey these are the games that we allow to go to playstation 2 um yeah does that sound that right to you sense. by chance yeah 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 that makes sense because like when it like you're saying they're they're i mean i know microsoft is the the bigger company but right right when you put it under the xbox brand and they have an xbox console it's like saying you bought a ford part but it doesn't go on a ford car kind of thing you know you can't mm-hmm. you know, yeah I, I see that differentiating just your your brands yeah, uh, we'll have to see. It, it was just an interesting move. There are they have, of course, they have um, Ninja Theory, they have Obsidian, they have Double Fine, and all those still retain their name, but they're very much Xbox as well. Um, mm-hmm. Rare is that kind of way where it's like, look, yeah, you're rare, but everybody knows your Xbox as well, and everything that Rare makes is exclusive for Xbox. So Vault might be the this new exception to the rule where they're not exclusive for Xbox and they're doing their own thing. Mm-hmm. All right, last bit of news that we're going to talk about before we get into our Audible uh, review. Uh, we have two new Avatar board games coming. This is Avatar The Last Airbender. One is out now, and it's uh, available at launch, sorry, Box Lunch, um, which they have a really good online store, but if you guys do go to a mall that is open, a lot of times they're in malls, but right now you can still shop online. This game's only 20 bucks, really good steal. And I'll go ahead and read the, the this is the insert for the synopsis from the, the website. In the game, you must follow Uncle Iroh's advice and craft your own cartoon stories using characters, locations, events, animals, and special item cards. You can save your favorite written sto- uh, stories as memories and use the White Lotus tile, Avatar State, and Appa tokens to make your story more unique. So it sounds like a game where you're kind of like basically creating a story uh, by randomized cards or something like that. What do you think yeah. about that? Yeah, so it sounds like uh kind of like a a easier simpler version of D and D. Yeah. Right? Like you're kind of playing a role play through the cards that kind of help create your adventure. Mm-hmm. Um so yeah, it sounds pretty cool. I was looking at it online actually uh myself, but I was like, oh yeah, I should totally just order this. I'm gonna buy it. You know, as soon as I saw you you wrote about it. Um and I was like, yeah, as soon as we can get together we'll play it. It's like, oh wait, when are we gonna be able to get together? That I might know. be a little while. <laughs> like, I'll wait till we have a place. That'll probably be, you know, even cheaper by then anyways. So we can all gather. So yeah, but yeah, it, it that sounds fun. I love Avatar. I love Uncle Iroh and everything in it's that so world. So yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. The one I will buy instantly is the one being made by Magpie. So the other one, it's coming out February twenty twenty two, and it is a big tabletop RPG game. So this will be Avatar D anD D. And mm-hmm. now that I've gotten to playing D anD D, I'm like, yes, I want more of this. Uh, it's a lot of fun. And they said that you're going to be able to play as both Aang and Korra's generation. So you'll be able to get, and there's going to be two expansions they already have planned out. So Republic City is one expansion. That'll be really cool. And the other one will be Spirit World. Um, and then, there, you know, there's going to be more along the way. So say you're playing Avatar, Jolly. You're playing the Avatar yeah. RPG. And you have mm-hmm. to make a character knowing somewhat of D&D's rules. What bending would you choose? And would you be like chaotic good, chaotic bad? A neutral, what do you think? Ooh, I think I would be a waterbender rogue, but I would conceal my bending abilities. Oh. And I would love, uh, yeah, I would play as if I'm a, maybe an earthbender or an earth nation native that doesn't have bending abilities mm-hmm. and live amongst the people. Keep it very secretive. 
uh, and use bloodbending. That'd be dope. Oh man, bloodbending. Oh, as a rogue would be very cool. Mm -hmm. Would you be good, bad, or or, or neutral? Uh, I would be. Hmm. I would say I would say good, but I would be bad for good's sake. I think I would do kind of the the Robin Hood thing, but Robin Hood slash Batman killing unnecessarily. That's uh, chaotic to, good then to save. There you go, chaotic yeah, good. That's bad. That's that's badass. Um, chaotic good. Yeah, that's actually my current D and D character. Chaotic good, and it's nice. it's a lot of fun to play that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so myself, I would go Earth Nation just because if I could pick any nation, it would definitely be Earth Nation. But mm. I think I would go with a paladin and somebody who worships the Earth. And mm -hmm. I would also probably go chaotic good. Like Paladin generally you'd like, oh, okay, you're gonna play Paladin. Here you go, here's Lawful Good. You're always gonna play Lawful Good usually. Um, but as chaotic good, maybe I could play an evil paladin. I've never played a bad guy on D and D or, or anything like that. So I maybe I would do that. But I like the idea of like being chaotic in your action because when you're an earthbender and you do something chaotic, it's drastic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're gonna be like, oh, yeah. I'm gonna split this earth real quick. We'll just fall down real fast. Like, oh, we need to get away from the fire. Okay, let me just open the earth up. And it would be like this yeah. whole mess up situation. So I could see a lot of very fun situations popping up from that. Um, mm -hmm. I I'm excited to explore these worlds uh, through a DD and d aspect. That's, that that's definitely a purchase for me. So get ready, guys. We're going to live stream that. I'm, a, I'm <laughs> predicting now, February 2022, we're going to be live streaming the, the Avatar D&D &D game that we were all playing. <laughs> That'd be good. Yeah. All right, let's go ahead and get into our X-Men Days of Future Past review, which I thought was a lot of fun. Let's, go, let's start with just kind of a brief overall, how did you like it? What'd you think? I I liked the story. I thought it was pretty good. Um, but I've listened to other audiobooks, and one thing I liked about this is how descriptive it was, how detailed it was. But I kind of think that made it harder for me, for some reason, somehow, it made it harder for me to really get into the scene, which seems backwards um but so i i i like the story i don't think i necessarily liked the book overall though what what about so you didn't like the audiobook part of this of the audiobook yeah i think i probably would have liked the story better just reading it it and it's it just doesn't make sense to me I, i'm not sure why this is obviously um uh, but it was so descriptive you there was uh which is great there was so much uh sound effects that are i mean there to put you in the scene to help mm -hmm. you, you know, visualize it and stuff. Um, but to some extent, I feel like I'm hearing it. So it, it's, it's so much like I'm listening to a movie that I should be watching it as well. And I'm not oh, seeing well. anything, obviously. So I'm having to, you know, there's, it's kind of like they're not leaving enough to the imagination for me to create the scene in my own head, the way I would imagine it. Yeah. I don't know. It was just kind of weird. It was kind of weird to me. Um, so yeah, I did I did like it, but it was it, it was missing something. I think I think I would have liked it better uh just to to read it the old fashioned way or read it in a comic book. Yeah. One one thing that was um I don't know how to say it. Yeah, sorry, I I, I don't know how to say it. But yeah, it was it was it was good overall. It was just uh kind of hard for me to visualize. So this is your first audio drama, correct? Uh oh yeah I guess I mean I've I've listened to audio books maybe that's the big difference is yeah. I'm used to you know a story with the you know people talking and stuff this was mostly a narrator watching the battle scenes and explaining them like a uh, you know someone uh uh what do you call it a TV reporter on a football game or something like yeah. that um so that was I think what kind of was off putting for me it wasn't so much you know, in the battle, listening to the characters communicate back and forth very much as much as it was a narrator telling you the details of the scene, uh, which was, yeah, it's just kind of harder for me to sink into, I think. Because you, you like, so in general, you like audio books more than audio drama, right? I guess. Oh, well, I think this is my first audio drama. Uh, I've listened to audio in books general, before. Right? But yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good yeah. You really don't have a whole lot to compare it to. Um, yeah. So this is, of course, based off of the comic book uh, run, the X-Men comic book run. Um, called Days of Future Past. Uh, it originally came out in 1981, written by Chris Claremont. Uh, this is based off of the book version, later uh, done by Alex Irvine. He's he's the one that kind of makes made this put together uh, uh, for the audio, like the script, basically, right? Um, mm -hmm. Narrated by Richard uh, Rowan. What? How did you think Richard did in narrating it? He was the narrator, not the voices. Yeah, yeah. I th I think he did good. It was a very 
you know, very clear, well read. Um, he didn't have to put a whole bunch of infliction or infliction, inflection, a bunch of changing <laughs> in his voice because uh, he was just telling the story. He didn't need to do character voices and stuff, which I think was great for him. Um, but I think at the same time, I don't know, hit just him narrating so much of the story and not being played out through the characters' conversations. Uh, I think is what kind of. I mean, honestly, I I fell asleep at one point. I was listening to it sitting in bed. Uh, yeah, when I got home from work and I just ended up passing out and I was like, oh wait, I got to go back like, you know, a good 20 minutes and go back where I was. <laughs> um, but I just need to not get too comfortable when I'm listening to an audio book. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I feel like for a voice actor, he did a good job. I just don't know. Maybe he wasn't best cast for this or maybe I just don't care for audio dramas as much as regular yeah. audio books. Because I think as a narrator, I think he did good. And I, I wouldn't mind hearing him do regular audio books as well. I think he did pretty good. Okay, so me, like just my overall, is I really enjoyed this. And I think a mm. lot of that's coming off of Sandman that I didn't care for. So I was mm. constantly comparing this to Sandman. And in my opinion, it's much more fast-paced. It's a story I already knew, so that helped a lot too. That, that kind of helped fuel like where I knew everything was going to go a little bit. And I, I had a better... It was easier to picture the characters. I mean, I think like... Was there any voice actor that stood out to you? For me, it was um, it was the one that played, played Professor X, although he wasn't in there very much. Uh, the one that played uh, Magneto was solid. But hearing Wolverine was... That that guy did a really good job. He was almost <laughs> as good as the animated Wolverine from the animated X-Men series in the 90s. Uh, was there anybody that stood out to you? That's, uh, that's what I was going to say. I honestly couldn't think of other characters' voices... Uh, when you call it out, when you ask me like that, except for uh, Wolverine Logan, because he was just so iconic. It was very clearly that's who he's, even if he doesn't say who he is, when you hear the voice, you know, if this is X-Men, that's got to be Wolverine. Um, so yeah, very well portrayed. Yeah, we, but what's funny is how you uh, right talk about uh, how you, relis- you you just came from Sandman and stuff like that. Can I just me? got done listening to two Star Trek books that I really enjoyed. Um, and so for me to go from, from listening to Star Trek books that I really liked and I, I could visualize a hundred percent the whole cast and crew and everything that's going on on the ships, because I know all, all of, you know, the Star Trek series, all, or at least the Voyager. Uh, so going from something that was real high for me, like you're going from something that was real low with Sandman. And so you were impressed. I went from something I really enjoyed in Star Trek. And now this is kind of a, you know, not, not so much my field or not so, engaging for me i guess or overwhelming probably but uh that's just kind of funny we're just complete opposite ends of the spectrum on this really okay jonathan can you hear me right now yes okay so there was a big pause but then everything you were saying went real fast it did sound good so we're gonna keep it all i'm just gonna edit around it because it did you did make a good point how we're coming from different sides of the spectrum i did like that Mm -hmm. it was just for a bit there i was just like well, at least his side was recording. Hopefully he's saying good things. And then I'm like, okay, be real fast. <laughs> That's why I'm trying to keep talking enough until I yeah. can see your video catches up. And then it's yeah. like, okay, we're good. We're good. Perfect. That's a professional uh, podcaster. I'm going to, I'm going to have fun uh, editing the video of this, which is going to be a lot harder. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Um, okay. So let's go into uh, characters. So we had, uh, let's go over the main characters really, which for, for the, one of them is Kitty Pride, which later becomes Shadowcat and then Sprite in her younger version. Uh, how did you think she did? Because she was the one that they sent back. And we'll compare this to the movie a lot because I think a lot of people are more familiar with the movie than anything else. In the movie, they send back Wolverine. This one, they're sending back uh, Kitty uh, or Kate, depending on which version. How did you think her character was in the, in the story? Uh, the character or the voice acting? Let's go with Let's go with the voice actor and then the character. Uh, that's a good point. We should bring up the voice actor, too. Yeah, I think the voice acting was well. I like that, and, and you know, I I don't know, I don't have a lot to compare it on, obviously, but I do like how well you can differentiate between Kate and Kitty. Yes. That, you know, she was dominant and, and knew the plan and knew what needed to be done as Kate. And then as Kitty, she's just like, I don't even know where I am. What, what Who are these people? Why are you guys, you know, so old and things like very, you know, 13-year-old or however old she was. Yeah. That's that's kind of the part that I wanted to make sure to bring up is the fact that I liked how the voice actor did a good job of of making it very clear which which uh, Kitty Pryde you're with because the, that she did like oh I'm 13 and oh I'm an older woman who's been fighting this war forever you know uh, which was yeah. really good um, I I especially liked okay so um, I think we should probably break down the story uh, a little bit so people kind of understand in case you haven't watched a movie or are familiar with this pretty popular story as well. Um, and I'll, I'll just do that real quick. So we're dealing with two different timelines. And in the future, it's a dystopian future where the Sentinels have started targeting everybody. 
um, what's different from the movie again, I'm going to keep referencing it this way. So you guys understand, um, is it, isn't that it wiped out all of humanity. It's just that in, especially North America, the Sentinels are, are, are targeting mutants. Uh, they're making them do errands for them with a collar that inhibits their abilities. Uh, and anyway, so, and then there's, I love how the Canadians kind of saw this coming. So they started their own, like the Canadian freedom force or whatever it's called. And Wolverine's part of them. It's great it's a little side thing. He's basically the only free mutant in New York right now. Uh, and everybody else is in this, this bondage. And so the first thing he does is he breaks them out. And then the idea, the big idea for the future version, we're going to call it future and then past version. The future version is to get into the Baxter building, which is where the Fantastic Four is normally. We find out that they all died in, in the, the war that happened prior. Um, to get into the Baxter building and to stop the communication device that's letting all the Sentinels communicate with each other, which is giving them their advantage. Mm -hmm. And in the past, the idea is there's the Brotherhood that is now back led by Mystique. There is the um, Hellfire Club, which is so cool because I, I didn't know Hellfire Club was involved in this, and they are a really cool group of people. They're total hassles, of course, but I do like them a lot. Um, then the X-Men. The X-Men are trying, and, and they're all kind of converging at the Senate hearing uh, on, you know, uh, what are we going to do about the mutants and stuff like that. Uh, and it's, and you have like, <laughs> you have Mystique wanting to roll up in there and just take out Senator Kelly, who's always been like anti-mutant. And she's like, I'll take him out and he's not a threat anymore. Which you guys you've seen the movie is similar to her plan there too. Uh, take out the guy who's going to stop us. And, but the problem is that example leads to a terrible future. And that's why they're like sending her back to like, hey, Make sure this doesn't happen so that, that people don't automatically think we need to hunt down all the mutants. So you have those two stories going on. Uh, but let's go back to a character level. And one thing that's really cool is in the future, Colossus, Peter, and um, Shadowcat, uh, Kate, it, are, are, are married and they have multiple kids. The kids have unfortunately passed in a war. But uh, I really like that part because when she goes back into her old body, and then you have not only, this is unique too, it's not like, in the movies, young Wolverine goes to the future, but they actually switch bodies in this one. So you had older Kate goes into the young body and then 13 year old Kate is an older body. And you have Colossus who's like, Oh my love, are you okay? <laughs> and she's like, Oh, what the fuck? I really liked it. How did you think that they did with their relationship in this story, John? Yeah, I think that was cute. A little, you know, romantic dynamic in the middle of a dystopian future and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it was, it was funny that you don't think about that kind of thing with, you know, time travel movies and stuff, but, uh, they did it very gracefully, I think, and and how Colossus, you know, right away realized like, oh yeah, she's a thirteen year old girl. She must be petrified being in this future, let alone you know that I could be married to her and stuff like that. So they they kept that kind of distance and you know made it made it uh, made us aware of uh, how they were both kind of feeling and how he was being gentle and uh, trying to help her kind of get up to speed. Um, but yeah, it was very well managed i guess but it was it was a cute kind of way to lighten this dystopian future that they're in the middle of yeah and it actually brought more impact at, at one point when you know spoiler alert of course that's just how it is later on same thing in the movie too where the future version like everybody is dying off like each x-men dies in a different mm -hmm. way trying to get their mission done and colossus is there and he's just like in his final moments, he's thinking of like, I hope Kitty's okay. I hope Kate's okay in the past. And, and he's just like, this is for her. This is for my children. And he dies like being just blown up by, by Sentinel. And it's just like, it was a, it was an extra piece that really added to his death. that really made it, you know, more heartfelt and everything like that. Um, so I, I really like that. And then of course, the past version of Kitty, the, the, the part that goes to the past, um, her, I just loved how much she's like trying to convince everybody. She says like, yeah, Storm said you convincing you would be the hardest part. She's trying to convince everybody to side with her. And every time they encounter somebody new, just like she's nuts. <laughs> and they have to convince her and stuff like that was really good. Uh, what was some of your favorite parts uh, out of this story? And then we'll move on to our, our uh, Tupperware. Oh, favorite parts. Um, God put me on the spot like that. I can't think of a specific scene. Um, God, I'm terrible at this. I didn't take notes or anything, too. I'm sorry. Oh man, I got the notes. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll go. I'll yeah, go. With my favorite part. What do you Wolverine. Got? Wolverine introducing the crew to the freedom fighters, the Canadian freedom fighters that have come mm -hmm. down to like just fight this war that they not, didn't necessarily 
start or volunteer for. It was really awesome. Uh, and it was, man, it's just so cool to see Wolverine like in the head of a military legion because it's he he did that for hundreds of years, a couple hundred years. He was in, in all of our military wars. If you saw the Wolverine origin movie, I thought it was, you know, it's not great, but it was a pretty cool part of it. Um, and so him kind of having this crew and, and, and stuff like that. And then they, they knew the city, uh, because they had like people who are loyal to the mutant cause, though they weren't really mutants, uh, helping them. And they had like this inner network thing. It kind of reminded me of like the Maquis in France during world war two that had this underground network helping each other out with information and helping out here and there. Really cool. I like that. My other favorite part, this is a major spoiler warning guys in the future Kitty thinks she's the last one, and she's just like, well, I'm going to die here. I wish I could go out and, you know, in glory and stuff like that. And they keep thinking that Magneto, who was in a wheelchair, and they, you know, he, they keep thinking he got collapsed and killed back early in the story. But then he comes flying in with, like, a makeshift shift he, uh, a ship he makes for himself, you know, and he's, like, flying in, and he's taking out Sentinels by himself. Like, he was designed for this. And he's just ripping through Sentinels. And there's one part in the midst of a fight where he's using a sentinel hand as his chair. And I was like, Google, Google, Google. I've got to find an action figure of this. And sure <laughs> enough, there's a big old statue of this, and it looks freaking awesome. And so you guys look that up. Magneto in sentinel hand. It's such a cool statue. And it's old man Magneto because that's what this is, you know. Anyways, uh, it just – because we haven't gotten much of the X-Men in the MCU, which this really ignited my love for the X-Men again because I love the X-Men so much as it is growing up. Uh, it's just like, man, what would Magneto look like in the MCU? He's such a powerful mutant that, I mean, he would stop any Iron Man, anything, War Machine, all of that. I'm just like checking through like everybody he'd be able to take out in the Avengers. And it's a lot of them. Vibranium. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, it's oh, wait, just, that's a good question. Can he affect Vibranium? Is it, is affect it, adamantium, uh, I phosphorus? Would, I know. Yeah. Vibranium is more like a living Is it affected by almost. magnetism? Uh, yeah. I don't know. People out there definitely know That's the answer to it, and we're just shooting in the dark here, both right. buzzing from a good audio book. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that final fight scene with Magneto just ripping through Sentinels, because cause at this yeah. point, again, he's in the wheelchair, and he's kind of like a beaten down old man, and the thing that they keep bringing, they brought it up a couple times, he says, uh, I was born in a concentration camp, and I will not die in one, and that was his big thing, and he, yeah. you know, well, he didn't, he, he left the concentration because he, he was there when they were breaking him out, and just starts ripping through him, and it was just such a cool mm -hmm. scene. Uh, yeah, it, I remember. This, oh, sorry. I remember the scene where, um, uh, where he breaks out of the concentration camp too, and it's kind of cool that it brings me back to X Men too, when he could feel the metal again, kind of thing. And it's the same oh, thing there yeah. when he he realized he could feel, you know, the the metal around him again and stuff like that. And then he puts the nails in one guy from a board and stuff like that. It's just kind of like, and then he he could feel inside the uh, Sentinels, and he, I don't remember how he did it. He just, I think he just like. Uh, crushed him from the inside kind of thing because he yeah uh he starts feel... shredding them at the end and he has them like circling around yeah. him like they described him as a planet with the yeah. with like the moons around Shrapnel, him yeah <laughs> which to me was really great description because i was visualizing that right away like from not only that from kitty's position like looking up and seeing mm -hmm. this guy just like hovering with like sentinel parts around him and it's just like fucking, he's a badass so yeah, uh, yeah. it was really cool. And then that's an important part that I forgot to mention too when I was describing the story. These guys were in a camp for mutants and they had the the collars around them. And when Wolverine went in there to break them out, they started getting the collars off and using their powers for the first time. And when mm -hmm. you use your power, it it's a signal for the Sentinels to come and kill you and get you. So they were like, well, I mean, if we're going to do it, this is the time to do it, stuff like that. And so that was a really good description of how Magneto started to feel the metal again. And they did a good job mm -hmm. with that. That was really cool. Yeah. Uh, there's uh, okay, another Jordan, scene I, I like. I don't remember exactly how it played out because this was probably questions, between okay? the falls. Here we go. Let's just start go through them and discuss um, them. It was with the uh, storm. I remember she was going. They were going up the elevator, and this was one of those again where it kind of was like, "Oh yeah, storm is a lot more you know badass than than uh, I remember from the show." Because I was like, "Oh yeah, she can control the weather and stuff," um, but that she controls a whole lot more than just the clouds and the sun and, and you know generic weather. Uh, but she controls more or less like the environment and nature around her to an extent. Uh, when they're going up the elevator and she creates like a static signal that goes through the whole building. And I think it like shocks all the sentinels to, or, or distracts all the sentinels, whatever messes up their signals. So they're all kind of uh, disoriented when they come out to attack at the, at the top. So I was like, that was, I don't know the way they described it was a lot better than I can, but 
uh, it was a cool scene with, with the storm. In, in general, I thought they did a really good job describing the battle scenes. Yeah. They were concise with them because sometimes when you, when you, you know, you kind of like get into the little details and stuff like that. Some books just don't do good describing battle scenes. I mean, as much as Game of Thrones is amazing, guys, they, he, George R. R. Martin does not describe a battle scene very well, in my opinion. Everything yeah. leading up to it's amazing. <laughs> <You know? laughs> really, uh, looking looking back on it, I think part of what was hard for me to really immerse in it is this isn't something you could enjoy or pay good attention to while playing a video game, or you know, you probably should yeah. be doing this while driving, or uh, you know, sometimes at work or something like that. You really gotta pay attention to the story because it's so much detail. It's yeah. it's like an overload. You gotta you know. That's why I fell asleep as I was listening to it. I was like, I just need to close my eyes and really visualize it because there's so yeah. much going on. It's hard to even keep the characters straight, let alone the scenes and who's killing who and how many Sentinels are they at now and you know, is this in the past or the future? So I was like, okay, <laughs> focus. But then sure enough, I fell asleep. Uh, but yeah, that, it was really detailed. That's true. And another thing on top of that, Jonathan, is this is a four hour and 40 minute audiobook. So it was mm-hmm. it was kind of fat. And if we were talking about fast paced, it, it was quite fast paced to where like during the battle scenes, it was just like, oh, what? Oh, so much one right after another. I hope you guys yeah. enjoyed my sound effects. Um, <laughs> I remember one part in particular where they were like, the Sentinels were coming down the road. And so Colossus like kind of, it just happened so quick, but he like lined himself up where he was going to ram through the supports of one building and then like keep going through the supports to top of the building over on the Sentinels. But they described that whole thing in like 20 seconds. And it mentally I'm sitting there picturing this and I'm just like, that was an epic thing. That would have been like in the trailer for this movie, and you guys just <laughs> went through it in twenty seconds, and you're on to the next yeah. thing. You know, so there's a lot of cool stuff like that. Okay, here's one you actually kind of brought up a storm uh, from the first one out of the Tupperware. Tupperware of topics, guys. We repurposed it for the audiobooks, just in case you guys didn't know that. Uh, did you learn something you didn't know before? And you got a good point with storm. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think I learned that storm's abilities are more than just uh, rudimentary controlling of weather. Um. I, I mean, I learned a lot more about that dystopian future because from the movie, there was very little of it. I mean, there's just yeah. little glimpses of them fighting and almost dying and well, everybody little by a little dying off. Um, so that was really cool. It's like you could almost have a whole nother series or movie that just takes place in that future. Like take us, you know, a year before this when the battle was starting or something like that and let us see what leads up to this in that future uh, time period before they send Katie back. Uh, it was a really you know, cool world to be in. That's the thing, too. That, that In the movie, they did like, you know, it was probably like 92% of the movie was all in the past. When yeah. the book was about 50-50. Like, you really mm-hmm. did get a lot of the, of the future. And uh, that was really cool. I liked that. And it made it made the loss of characters. Because in the movie, they did the loss of character thing, too. But they did it boom, boom, boom. It mm-hmm. made a lot more impact because it's like, oh, there goes another one. There goes there's, there goes Benjamin. Oh, there goes another one. Like, it's so... Rachel, oh, wow. They really mess with Rachel because not only does she die off like everybody else, but they mortally wound her early on. They mm-hmm. know she's going to die. So does she. And they keep her with her the whole time knowing she's going to die. And then, yeah. oh, it sucks later on towards the end when she's like, she could feel people dying. She knows when they die. And so she's like, yeah, I know that this one died. I know Wolverine got crushed. I know... Oh man, that's that's a heartbreaker right there. Kind of recap, like, hey, there's how many people you just lost in right. the future. The thing that I learned personally has I, I gained more respect for for Shadowcat for for Kitty Pride. Um, her character has always been kind of just a neat character, neat power. Like, oh, what would I do with that? Uh, but especially with that last scene in the president, we'll talk about that towards the end. But where that she's spying on the president. And it was kind of like, man, I didn't think about how powerful that ability is and stuff like that. So I just kind of gained more respect for her because she was always kind of a minor character to me. But I, and they did a really good job for her. I kind of wish the movie utilized her better. I don't know. They kind of gave they gave Rachel's power to her as well in the movie. So it kind of took, I don't know, took away from Rachel, which was a really good character. But anyways. Yeah. That's the problem too is there's a lot of X-Men. So there's a million of great characters they just haven't gotten to utilizing yet. That's true. And hopefully the MCU nails it. Mm-hmm. we'll have to fan cast all of the X-Men at some point and then do uh, send that into Marvel as well like we like to do yeah. uh, if you were to write fanfic about this book what kind of story would you want to tell Ooh, oh easy Sh- uh, tell the love story between um, uh, Kitty and, and uh, Peter Colossus, Colossus. Yeah, yeah Peter 
Yeah, that would be that'd be pretty cool. Just I mean, it would be devastating to see. It would be also awesome to see the war where they lost so many mutants and you know the Sentinels first arose. Mm-hmm. But it'd be devastating to see them lose their children. But it'd be kind of cool to just follow, you know, like them into that that segue into the future time frame. Yeah, I I would like to see. Uh, because they talk, they talk about it towards the end there too. Like, there's also there's multiple universes. There has to be. Like, she was like, "Oh, I hate to think that my my form is back into the future where everybody died." Right? That she's thinking about that at the end. Uh, but I would like to see a version of you know, Shadow Cat's back in her normal body in the future that's all destroyed, and she starts to rebuild like the Xavier School. I would like to to make a fan fiction about like a New Hope kind of thing about her bringing back like in, embracing mutants and stuff like that because. The mutants in North America were hunted down, but the, the mutants around the world, it seems like, from according to the book, still out there. So uh, she could start making a new home for them and stuff like that in America. Well, cool. but if they were effective in the past, all that changed in the future, right? Well, that's what, yeah, but that's what, that's, yeah, that's what Xavier says. He says, you know, that's just one outcome. There's all, there says there's a different ones for every choice you make. And so he was mm-hmm. saying that like, because she was like, oh man, I hate that she went to the future that was so dystopian. I hope we changed it. And he says, she's probably there and there's probably multiple where you did help and stuff like that. Like he left it really open. He liked to mm-hmm. mess with her mind a little bit. That's and, true. Yeah. Because we don't know what kind of time rules they follow, but there could be a different yeah. different timeline where they still are all dead. He tells her that trying be. to like appease her and make her like more comfortable. And she's like, that just made things worse. That's something else to worry <laughs> about. She says, that's cute the way she yeah. says it. Yeah. 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 that. All right, let's look at our next one here. Next one out of the Tupperware. Uh, were there any parts of the book you thought were incredibly unique, out of place, thought-provoking, or disturbing? All right, so I was just thinking about this earlier, too. One thing I they, they might have touched on it, and I just don't remember, but uh, one thing that I thought was kind of a hole, I guess, or didn't really make much sense to me is uh, in the future time, they have... Um, uh, you just said her name. Rachel is the one that, that has to send Katie Pride back, right? Yeah. Um, and be able to, you know, swap them and all the stuff. Uh, and she's mortally wounded, dying slowly and stuff. Everybody else is doing is, is fighting the Sentinels, and they have that whole plan of how to, uh, you know, stop break their link and stuff like that. But uh, all their eggs are in her being sent back to the past, right? Yeah. So I would I would not be pushing forward in this other you know battlefront and i would be you know retreat her back to you know a vault somewhere underground and everybody just keep a bubble around her and just protect her and don't let her die yeah. so that, that doesn't make you know i didn't i didn't that's really get the that change connection. the movie made to be honest with you because that's exactly okay. what they did in the movie yeah kitty in this in the movies you know kitty price she's the one that sends her back sends wolverine mm-hmm. back and then all the eggs are in that basket because they've been using what they've been doing this whole time is using uh, Kitty Pride to use cable to go back and like, oh, they found us jump back a few days. Oh, they found us jump back mm-hmm. a few days and fix it so they could kind of know where the warnings are at or the wars are going to be at. Uh, but this time when they do send Logan back, they know that it's a one way trip and it's their only chance. And mm-hmm. um, and yeah, so the whole movie, they're just basically hiding from the Sentinels and trying to fight them <laughs> off. So that mm-hmm. is the plan they do in the movies. But yeah. Yeah, uh, I can't think of anything in particular I would say is out of place. I would have liked this as a standalone story. I know Senator Kelly's in a lot of the stories, um, and he's even in the first movie, the first X-Men movie. But if in the beginning of this they kind of explained why Senator Kelly hates mutants so much would be pretty good. Like if there was an incident Mm -hmm. that incited his hatred for mutants would kind of portray Senator Kelly as like maybe an opportunist or something like that. Because towards the end, he's still a jerk. Although he learned his lesson, he didn't learn his lesson at the very end. Uh, let's discuss that now, actually. That final scene, we see Senator, because there's something happened in it that was super cool to me. Uh, we had Senator Kelly talking to the president, basically saying like, we need to sign the okay on the next generation of Sentinels, which is like, dude, what? Uh, <laughs> to hunt them down. And then the president, who's like a little bit more okay with everything, he's like, the sent- or the mutants that just saved your life? He's like, yeah, but the- those are the mutants that won this time kind of thing. Um, so first of all, we kind of have something we've talked about before with the Year Hell episode. Um, is this all still going to happen? Because now they're just making new versions of mutants. What do you think? Or new, I'm sorry, new versions of Sentinels. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. It's 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 hard when you play with time. You know, we've talked before. It just doesn't it doesn't always go the same way. You can't necessarily predict time depending on what rules you're going by. Is this you know Back to the Future you know kind of yeah. situation or not? Or Rick and Morty. Um, but I mean the fact that they left that thread open 
I think that that is showing us that you, I don't think it has to mean that everything's still going to happen the way it was originally happening. I think it means more you stopped one of the triggers that could cause this many, you know, this series of unfortunate events. Uh, but, you know, humanity still is afraid of you. You still are more powerful than them. So there still will be other things that come up that time and time again, you have to keep fighting the good fight to bring peace between your people. And it's not just, you know, that one trigger was what, you know, caused the end of the world, but without it, everybody's going to be hunky dory. Uh, you know, you got to keep, keep looking and, and finding those uh, problems before they come up, I guess. Yeah. Uh, the other person that was in the room that I thought was important uh, during this story, we, we hear a lot about the uh, hellfire club and, and they talk about how Emma Frost is leading the hellfire club, which is, you know, she is, you know, in there too. Uh, but then they talk about in that room is Sebastian Shaw, who is a leader of the Hellfire Club. So it's kind mm -hmm. of like Sebastian Shaw is also guiding the future, which is, you know, makes the Brotherhood look good <laughs> half the time. Mm -hmm. um, and and I just really liked the fact that they made sure to add. This is just, again, it's another situation where there's like, there's also this, you know, there's also <laughs> another future in this story where uh, they're having to fight off the Hellfire Club the whole time. So it was really good. Uh, okay, let's go into our next one. We'll do uh, we'll do three more. I'll just pick them out now. Boom. And that one. Okay. I'm opening up slowly. Okay. Which place in the book would you most like to visit? Mm. Would you like to go to the dystopian future, Jonathan? Or a <laughs> or a Senate's chamber that almost got blown up by mutants? <laughs> right. Uh, I mean that to visit it again in a book or movie, the dystopian future would be a lot cooler. Good call. Uh, yeah. to to go on vacation, I'd have to say, you know, the the past time which is our near future or i think it's like the that. 90s the past time is the 90s for us oh, okay yeah. it's 20 yeah, years yeah. before the dystopian year of 2020 yes that is when this the future takes place it's God. in 2020 <laughs> if only they knew how bad it really was <laughs> yeah boy i wish we had some sentinels <laughs> right jesus christ all right uh, did you have to force yourself to get through it or were you able to put it down or unable to put it down yeah so I had to force myself to get through it. Did you? Not because it wasn't a, it wasn't a bad story. It was a good. It was an interesting story. Mm -hmm. um, but I was listening to it at tidbits when I was busy with other things, and I thought was I think that was my biggest problem. I was uh, listening to some of it, you know, on my break at work. Listening to some of it while I'm driving. Uh, when I got home and I'm cleaning, and I know it's only four hours long. If, if I was able to just listen, yeah, if I could just listen to it in bed and not fall asleep, that would be perfect. Um, so yeah, I think me just allowing myself to be distracted and trying to listen to it in segments really kind of messed up the story to me. I couldn't really piece it together or, or you know, get immersed in it very well. Um, uh, so for, yeah, because of that, because I didn't dedicate time to it, it was hard to keep going through it. All right. Last, last piece of paper out of the topic, Tupperware. Uh, did you like it more or less than other books in the same genre? So let's, let's frame this a little bit better for you. Um, is this your favorite x-men story oh um no i think the dark phoenix is my favorite right story it kind of has to be the best one yeah, <laughs> it's so it's, good now i think the dark phoenix the the movie could have been done a little bit better yeah, there's yeah, you know sure. stuff i would i definitely would have changed on that but yeah i think i don't think this is the best storyline now that being said i think if the days of future past movie was reworked to follow this timeline a little bit better and yeah. match this i think that might make i think that might make it a better movie than the dark phoenix uh but yeah i think the dark phoenix story is my favorite i like that idea though yeah the movie actually following like redoing the movie that follows this storyline better yeah i like that um i would have to say the dark phoenix is my favorite uh, of the x-men stories but what i do like about this one is the sentinels are so important and i've always liked the sentinels as a bad guy they're just really cool um, yeah, I've just always been a Sentinel fan. Uh, they've just mm -hmm. looked neat. And then, of course, we had the fastball special in this, which is when uh, Colossus throws Wolverine at the head of a Sentinel, mm -hmm. which they, yeah. they do show at one point in the movies at some point, but um, it's kind of a... In, in the training classic. room, right? Yeah. In the, yeah. Yeah. Training room on X2, I think, or 3, one of those. Well, yeah, one of those. And it was just a cool little, like, oh, they do that in the comics all the time. And so it was cool to yeah. see it again. <laughs> that was really neat. One, one thing I, I remember now, too, that was different is I'm pretty sure in the movie, they ended up making a a certain series of sentinels that uh, were non non-metallic alloy right like 
uh, yes. you couldn't affect him. So okay. in the movies, yeah, in the movies, that, which, which that would definitely not work in the book, right? Because I would ruin the book, the book yeah. <laughs> Magneto destroys everything. Definitely look that statue up, guys. By the way, um, so in the movie, yeah, what it is is they took Mystique after she tried to kill um, Trusk or whatever it is, the guy that invented the Sentinels. Uh, they took mm-hmm. her DNA to make a Sentinel that can change, can adapt to whomever. So. If Pyro's blasting with fire, they'll turn to, to, to ice or freeze him or something like that. They could always yeah. count everybody, which is really cool because at one point, like, Colossus is fighting him because I made sure to watch the movie too so I can compare him the whole time. So it's fresh as well. Um, <laughs> Colossus is fighting him, whatever. And then you just see them, like, turn into the same metal, uh, living metal that steel that Colossus is and just, like, actually smash his head in, like, a tin can. So uh, it was it was pretty neat. <laughs> but yeah. All right, Jonathan. Uh, so this was your first audio drama. And you've listened mm-hmm. to audiobooks in the past. Would you suggest this for somebody who's new to audiobooks overall? I would. Now that we've talked about it more and I get a better understanding of it, I would totally suggest it if you can sit down and focus to the focus on the story. Yeah. And don't don't try to listen to it distracted. I've listened to other like the, you know I've listened recently, most recently, a couple of Star Trek Voyager books, and those are more casual listens. I think yeah, I can do you know driving and and shopping and things like that, but. Something like this, as fast paced and action packed as it is, uh, there's a lot of fine details coming at you left and right. So you really need to dedicate some time to it and be able to pay attention. Uh, I personally think this is really good. I've, I've listened to all of the audiobooks that we've had so far on the show. Um, and this one, compared to the other audio drama that we had, I think is better because it's just, it's quicker and it's more action packed and stuff like that. So it was a lot of fun to listen to the big battles and stuff going on. I think that they did a good job summing up what happened in the battles and making it quick i mean it is fast paced in that sense uh and so i I do suggest this for your first audio drama especially if you're already familiar with the story i think that helps at least familiar with the characters uh even if you watch the movie beforehand or something like that so that you kind of get an idea of what's going to happen i think that helps the next one is not only a shorter audiobook but it's also a story that i'm totally unfamiliar with but i do love the character quite a bit so we're going to be listening to daredevil guardians devil it is a two hour, two and a half hour audiobook, guys. It's super short, super cake. Uh, we're going to try to have everybody on for that one and really get some different opinions on this too because um, D- uh, Squeaks, who listened to this and he's all anxious to get on another one of these and stuff like that. Um, I-, I know that he's, I wanted to hear his opinion off of Sandman. Sandman, in comparison to this, it was uh, a 10 hour, 10 hour audiobook, audio drama with all this stuff like that. It had James McAvoy and like a killer st- a cast and all. But, because it was so big, they it was like they jumped around from book to book and the books were not very connected. So it was so cumber, uncumbersome and stuff like that. It just wasn't very enjoyable. While other people really enjoy it, I myself didn't care for it. And and, on us, and neither did Squeaks. So this next one's really short too. It'd be really good. Marvel has released a ton of these. And uh, we're, we're kind of, you know, if more people sign up for Audible, which you guys go to audibletrial.com backslash geekfreaks, we're going to keep doing these Audible reviews and, and reading with, along with you guys, listening along with you guys. By the way, it counts as reading, you guys. You can just put that down in your resume if you want to. Um, and so we'll keep going on with these. Uh, after the Daredevil one, we're actually going to be going back to a regular audiobook. Jonathan picked it, so I'm exu- and I'm super excited for it because I've been meaning to get to it anyways. So that'll be good. But that is it for us, you guys, and we hope you guys enjoyed this and check it out. Uh, again, audibletrial.com backslash geekfreaks. And we'll see you guys later. Bye. Bye.